All right, good morning, ladies, and uh, thank you for coming this morning as we continue on with our study in the uh, epistle of James. And this morning, we're going to be considering the patience of Job, a very timely lesson in light of uh, world events and what is going on. So let's pray together. We're going to be covering verses 7 through 11 this morning of chapter 5 of James. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this opportunity to be together. Thank you for the body of Christ. Thank you for this church. Thank you for these ladies. Thank you for uh, allowing us to come and to hear your word freely, that we are not um, being prevented from doing so. I thank you that we have your word, and I pray that we would never take that for granted, Lord, that we have the precious word of God uh, in our laps or on our phone, or we have it, Lord, and uh, may we not... Um, despise that or reject that. May we love it more and more. Help us today as we uh, unfold this text that you would give us ability to listen intently and to apply the things that we hear. And I pray this for your glory and your honor, that we would be patient during times of suffering and affliction and those daily things that even come up in our life as women, that we would be long-suffering not only in situations but towards people as well, Father. And we commit this time to you for your glory and your honor in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I want to, you to put yourself in the following situation. You're getting ready to go to the grocery store because you're going to have company for dinner. But you just have a little bit of time to run in and get your groceries and get out. So the first thing you do is get the shopping cart. And of course, you get the one that the wheel doesn't work. And so you go ahead and start, you know, thought, well, I do this, you know, I just go ahead and just put up with the wheel. So I start going down the, the aisles only to realize, and this actually did just happen to me in the last few months, that guess what? The grocery store has changed where everything is. I'm so used to going down one aisle, but guess what? They put it somewhere else. So I finally get my groceries and I get in the line to have my groceries checked and guess what? The lines are really long and so I don't know about you but sometimes I go get in another one only to find out that this one starts moving fast and now this one's long. So anyway you get in the line to have your groceries checked and you get to the checkout and the cashier is in training and she's new and she doesn't know what she's doing and so anyway you're getting your you know it's next it's your turn now and you're so happy because you have just very little time and it's your turn and guess what the cashier tape runs out and guess what she doesn't know how to change it so she's got to call someone to help her needless to say you're delayed what's your response or picture this scenario, Friday night, you get to go out to dinner with your husband, the family, or girlfriends, whatever you do, and you cannot wait because you have been, you know, starving yourself almost all day so you can go out to this restaurant. It's one of your favorite restaurants. And uh, so you're very excited. You get there, and you find out the wait is 45 minutes. And you think, okay, this is where everybody wants to go, so we'll just wait. So you finally get seated, and the waitress comes, and uh, remember you're hungry, you haven't hardly eaten all day, and so you order, it's your turn to tell the waitress what you want, and you tell her, and she goes, oh, I'm so sorry, we're out of that. We don't have that. What is your response? Do you respond with patience or impatience? Do you see God in the picture, or do you forget you're even related to him? <laughs> We all would admit sometimes it's, those things are hard, right? You might say, well, Susan, what does this have to do with our lesson? Well, for those of you who are here, our last lesson, we started chapter 5, and we saw that many of these readers that James was writing to were being persecuted unjustly by rich, oppressive people that had all these uh, land. They were landowners, and they owned all these farms, and they were not paying them. And James had reminded them to be patient even uh, towards their persecutors. And remember, some of them were being hauled into court unjustly, and some of them we saw last time were even being murdered. Now, the, the two scenarios I just gave to you hardly compare to these readers, right? I mean, these readers were really going through terrible persecution. But nonetheless, 
us, ladies, it still applies to us. Even in those daily things, we are commanded and admonished to be patient. And so James is going to admonish these poor readers, the ones being persecuted, to be patient. And he's going to give them three examples to follow. The patient farmer, the persistent prophets, and the patriarch Job. And this would be especially helpful to them in times of persecution. And ladies, I hope it will be helpful to you uh, because Jesus, just even in the last two days, we've already seen some things going on even in our nation that indicate we are going to be going even further in our slippery slope. And more than likely, some of us even in this room will suffer more persecution because of our stand in Christ. But we also need these warnings just even in everyday life to be patient towards a people and circumstances. So let's read the text together, and I'll give you an outline of where we're going. Notice what James writes. Be patient, therefore, brethren, to the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draws near. Murmur not one against another, brethren, lest ye be judged. Behold, the judge is standing before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy who endure. You have heard the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Now, as I mentioned, we're going to see three examples. First of all, the example of the patient farmer in verses 7 to 9. Then the example of the persistent prophets in verse 10. And then lastly, the example of the patriarch Job in verse 11. So let's look, first of all, at the example of the patient farmer. James says, therefore, so anytime there's a therefore, it reverts back to something. Therefore points back to the sufferings that he just mentioned in our last lesson. Because of these hardships, because you're being persecuted as Christians, because they're withholding your daily wages, because some of you are being treated unjustly and hauled into court, because even some of your family members have been murdered. He says, be patient. But notice what he does here. He calls them brethren. And remember last week when we were together, we discovered that he was in that, in chapter five, he starts out by talking to the rich men, these rich men that were not Christians. They were the ones that we're persecuting and all of a sudden now James switched back to his readers and he calls them brethren as he has throughout the whole epistle and we won't go into the switch from last week you'll have to reread the lesson or or listen to it but he calls them now brethren be patient brethren what's the word patient mean it means to be long-tempered. Now, ladies, I want to be very careful that we explain what it means. It doesn't mean to be passive, okay? A lot of people think being patient or long-suffering entails that I'm to be passive about things that are going on that are unjust, but that's not what it means. It just means that I'm to refrain from retaliation, I'm to have an attitude of self-restraint. It doesn't mean I don't speak up when things that are done that are unjust. Remember, even John the Baptist uh, said it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. <laughs> he spoke out, and so we are to speak out about injustice. injustice. But ladies, we are to be patient. Uh, patient is a fruit of the Spirit, right? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, gentleness, meekness, meekness long-suffering. That's patience, right? And this is the same attitude that God has, and we are to have his attitude. Psalm 86, 15 says, But you, O Lord, you're full of compassion, you're gracious, you're long-suffering, and you're abundant in mercy and truth. Now, ladies, put yourself in the shoes of these readers. Think how they must have felt uh, going through this persecution. And James says, be patient even if you're being treated unjustly, even if you're not receiving the wages for all the hard work that you've done. And James says, be patient. And the reader may say, well, how long, James? <laughs> how long do I have to be patient? Notice what he says, until the coming of the Lord. Until the coming of the Lord. Ladies, until Jesus comes back, we are obligated to leave vengeance up to him. Maintain a patient spirit. And I know sometimes it's hard, uh, even in our everyday living. Sometimes it's hard when to be patient um, 
I don't know about you, but I'm finding more and more it difficult for me to be patient in traffic. It just seems, even coming this morning, I don't know how many times I had to move my car over because somebody's in my lane. I mean, they're not all the way in, but just a little bit. They're starting to swerve, and I don't know if they're on their phone. I don't know what they're doing. But uh, I find it irritating that I have to be even more careful driving than I ever used to have to be because of other crazy drivers. I need to be patient. Or a strong-willed child. Um, you know, sometimes it takes a lot of patience when you have a strong-willed child that just will not obey the spoken word. Uh, or a difficult marriage. You might have a harsh husband. But we are commanded to be patient until the Lord comes. Um, ladies, whatever difficult person or trying situation tests our patience, we should be patient. And we should also remember our sufferings and our, our trials here are nothing compared to these readers. They are nothing compared to what they were going through, uh, not being paid, uh, hauled into court unjustly. And yet we are still commanded to be patient. Well, James is acutely aware of how hard it is for them to be patient. So he gives them the first example of patience by using a farmer who waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Notice what he says. <laughs> See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth until he receives the early and latter rain? Now, I don't know much about farming. In fact, you know, I just have house plants, and uh, I don't really know anything about farming. But my grandma used to have a garden, and I mean, she had the huge garden in her backyard, and all the perfect rows, you know, and that's about the closest thing to farming I know. But the farmer has to wait patiently, right, for the plants to grow. He has to allow the crop to mature. There's nothing he can do to speed up the process of getting his plants or his crops to grow. Um, in fact, the Jewish farmers in Palestine would plow and sow in what we know as the autumn months. And so the early rain, that would soften the soil, and then the latter rain would come in the spring to help mature the harvest. And ladies, we have to put ourselves again in the context in the shoes of these readers. Uh, they didn't have modern irrigation techniques like we have. In fact, I live in a neighborhood that if I go out a certain exit, uh, there's this huge farmland. And I've often, I walk there sometimes a lot. Debbie and I one time walked around the whole thing. But it's, there's nobody even there, not even a tractor watering it, some kind of modern irrigation system that just, you know, slowly, you know, goes over the whole thing and waters this guy's crops. Uh, they didn't have that in the biblical world. They had no modern way of watering their crops. And so what good would it do if the farmer said, you know, you dumb vegetables, would you hurry up and grow? I don't understand. Don't you know? I've got to have, I've got to have the crop. And that's what James saying. Be like the farmer who waits. He waits for the early and the latter rain. And so if he got angry at the vegetables or whatever it is he's growing, it wouldn't affect the plants, right? So what do, good does it do for us to get angry with those that are persecuting us or to get impatient with anyone? Ladies, just as the farmer exercises patience and long suffering while waiting for the crops to produce, so we should be patient and not vengeful in light of the Lord's return. James makes this point in verse 8. He says, you also be patient. You be patient just like the farmer. Don't lose your temper. Don't be filled with hatred through those who are oppressing you. You might say, well, Susan, how do I get this patience? How do I get this patience like the farmer? He gives the answer right here, two ways. First of all, establish your hearts. Secondly, in fact, the first way is to look into our hearts, and the second way is to look to heaven, <laughs> look at the coming of the Lord. So the first way, you want to know how to get patience? Establish your heart. What does this mean? Strengthen your heart. Make it stand firm, unmovable. Prop yourself up. 
Your faith needs to be firm and unwavering. Ladies, we've had these words way back in chapter 1 when we talked about the man who's going through trials. And remember, James says, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed about. And we saw then that we're to be stand firm in our faith. We're not to be doubting or wavering. And that same here is these, late, these people were going through trials uh, here in chapter 5, just like the man in verse 1 in chapter one and the same counsel is given prop yourself up establish your heart secondly james says the second way to develop patience is to look up <laughs> look up realize the coming of the lord is near ladies when you go through a difficulty in life and you're tempted to get impatient or angry you need to stop yourself and say wait a minute <laughs> Where's my faith in this? Where's my trust in the Lord? And then secondly, stop long enough to think, you know, the coming of the Lord. I, I, you know, the coming of the Lord's at hand. As Paul says, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us, Romans 8, 18. Ladies, that's how we take courage. That's how we are patient in difficult circumstances. You know the problem with most of us, and especially I think women, maybe more, perhaps more than anything, when we have something come into our life, we start dwelling on that circumstance, <laughs> or we start looking at the people that are irritating us instead of looking to the Lord and considering he is coming back. And ladies, we need to realize the coming of the Lord is drawing near, as James says. And so in light of that, what? We should be living righteously. We should be patient. If these people that are, are treating you unjustly, uh, remember the Lord, the Lord who is the judge of the earth, he will do right on that day. And vengeance is his, and we don't have to worry about retaliating. Ladies, we must look for the kingdom to come and not live for the kingdom here and now. I often tell women, you know, these small irritations, what do they matter in light of eternity? They really don't matter in light of eternity. And James says the coming of the Lord is at hand. What does this mean? It's imminent. It could happen at any time. Do you know the Lord could return while we're in here this morning? He could. Yeah, somebody's saying amen. Amen. Yes, amen. We all hope so, right? And you know what? The Lord's return should give us hope and help, right? And inner strength that we need when facing difficult situations. Our hearts would be propped up. We would be established if we really lived in light of his return. And ladies, boy, I tell you, we can look at the Bible and look at all the prophecies that have already been fulfilled. But you know, even now, even unbelievers are, you know, saying, I have a, a family member who's an unbeliever, and yet they even realize, uh, is this, is this what our dad was talking about when we were growing up? I mean, it seems like everything is lining up for the Lord to return, right? And he could come at any time. And that's what James says, be patient, establish your hearts. Why? For the coming of the Lord is drawing near. Well, evidence that his coming is near, but even so, hostility from others is not always easily endured. And so James realized our human nature wants to lash out or complain when going through trials. That's why in verse 9, he commands his readers to withhold complaining during hardships. Notice what he says. This command, do not grumble against each other, brothers. Do not grumble. The Greek word means to groan or murmur. And actually, ladies, it's not an audible groaning that James is talking about. It's more like this. <sighs> you ever done that? <laughs> you don't outwardly grumble like, oh, my goodness, are you kidding me? But it's like that. <sighs> Now, I, I have to say I've done that sometimes. I mean, I have to say that I've done that more than once. But, you know, it's that inward sign, like, really? For real? Ladies, an inner sigh, even the Lord hears, doesn't he? That inner murmuring that, I can't believe that. You know, this is happening again. And isn't it interesting? Notice according to this verse, their grumbling isn't against their oppressors. He says, don't grumble against each other, brothers. <laughs> 
Don't grumble against one another. You might say, well, why is he saying this? What's the warning here? Ladies, James is human. He, noticed, he knows the tendency we all have. Think about it. When you're going through hardships, when you're going through suffering, when people are driving you crazy sometimes or situations like we talked about at the grocery store or at a restaurant, what is the temptation to lash out at the person closest to you, right? Your husband, your children, what, whoever, you know, your closest friend. You kind of get short. You get irritated. That's what James says. Don't allow the sufferings and the persecutions of life cause you to grumble and murmur against each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. For example, your well-planned day may not unfold as you had hoped, right? We talked about this a few weeks ago when talking about planning our days. But it may not go as you plan. Uh, you know, maybe already this morning your day hasn't gone as you planned. Maybe, you know, something happened before you left home this morning. Someone spilled some milk or your husband asked you to run an errand that you didn't really have. Maybe you felt spilled coffee on your shirt. I don't know what happened. Uh, uh, the other day my husband's... He, car battery uh, went out and so he said I need to borrow your car to go wherever he was going and that was not in my plan for the day but sometimes what are we tempted to do when things go wrong we're tempted to take it out on our children or our husband who by the way have done nothing to deserve that unjust treatment that we give them right and so we need to remember the golden rule do unto others as we would have them do to us right well, the reason James commands us not to grumble or murmur against one another, notice what he says, behold, the judge is standing at the door. He's standing at the door. Ladies, do you realize that although your inward feelings of bitterness and criticism may not be expressed outwardly, the judge knows? That inward attitude of our heart that nobody sees, the judge knows. The judge who is standing at the door. James says, don't mumber, murmur, don't grumble each, uh, to each other. Why? Because he is standing at the door. I like what the Greek in, indicates here, that he's actually standing at the door with his hands there, ready to push them open. When the father says, go get my children, he's ready. And I'm, I mean, I hope, I hope the door is kind of opening right now, but he's, he's standing there waiting for the father to say, go get my children. Ladies, this should be a comfort to us right now, right? But it should also be a warning to us to, right, not murmur and grumble. Ladies, it's a shallow Christian who sees only God's love and grace without seeing his inevitable return where we will stand before him and give an account for those things that we've done in our body. He will come, even though I know some today uh, say, you know, I've been hearing this forever, and he still isn't here. Well, Peter says in his second epistle, you know, there's going to be some in the last days mocking, say, where's the promise of his coming? You know, we've been hearing this since our fathers fell asleep. And Peter basically says, he is coming. Uh, he's not willing that any should perish, but the Lord will come. And he talks about the earth being burned and everything in it. And then he says, seeing that these things are going to happen, what manner of people ought we to be in all holy living and godliness? Ladies, the same thing in light of the Lord's return. We should be living holy, and this would include that inner murmuring and grumbling. Well, James now returns to their difficult circumstances and encourages his readers to not only look at the patient farmer, but look at the persistent prophets. He says in verse 10, My brethren, take the prophets who've spoken in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. My brethren, take, the word take means Hold this before your mind. Oh, ladies, I wish that Christians today read the whole Bible. Take in your mind the prophets. You know, do you ever just read the Old Testament? As Paul says, these things were written for our learning that we through the scriptures might have hope. Do you ever look at the Old Testament, all the prophets, all the things they went to, through, even all the patriarchs? These are real people. This, the Bible is not a fiction. It's not a fairy tale. These people that are written in here, the prophets of old, they're real. They really lived. 
these things really happen to them. And we should take comfort in that. We should hold them in our mind. That's what James says, my brethren, take the prophets, put them in your mind. They spoke in the name of the Lord. Look at them as an example of suffering and of patience. Ladies, the prophets encourage us to remain steadfast in difficult times. Um, I just thought of some of the prophets. Remember Elijah, uh, he warned King Ahab, three and a half years of drought. And yet, you know, Elijah had to go through that drought. <laughs> he had to suffer, right? That was part of, even though he prophesied that, he had to suffer. Daniel's another one who suffered. Uh, he was thrown into the lion's den. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've never been thrown in a lion's den. I, that would take a lot of patience for me. Jeremiah, another prophet, he prophesied strong things, and yet he was abandoned. He thrown in a well and abandoned. Ezekiel, God told Ezekiel what? Marry a wife, and she's going to die the next day. <laughs> he suffered. Or how about Hosea was told to take an adulterous woman for a wife as an example of Israel's unfaithfulness. Ladies, those are just five men I've, met, I've named. Look at the prophets. They're an example for us of suffering and of patience. Those five men did not abandon their faith, even though they were thrown into a lion's den, even though they were thrown in an abandoned well, even though they were told that their wife was going to die the next day. They did not abandon their faith. In fact, in the phrase, who spoke in the name of the Lord, indicates why they suffered. Why did it go through this affliction? Why would anybody do anything like that? Because they were belonged to the Lord. They did it for the Lord's sake. As Paul says to Timothy, all those who live in godly in Christ Jesus will suffer. And so, ladies, the more godly you live this year, the more suffering I guarantee you're going to go through this year. And so that's something to look forward to, right? But because after this lesson, you're going to be strong. It'll be good, right? Ladies, their faithfulness to God amidst difficult times was a mark of their true character, a mark that they were truly in the faith. That's what we call in reform circles what? The perseverance of the saints. <laughs> we don't abandon our faith just because things get rough. And so James says these prophets are an example for us in two ways. Notice, first of all, they're an example of suffering and of patience. Ladies, look to the prophets. They show you how to endure suffering with a patient spirit. And I hope you're familiar enough with the Old Testament prophets that you can look at that and see and follow their example. And by the way, James was not a stranger to these things. Remember how we brought out, I don't know if you remember this, but we brought this out in our first lesson, that James himself died a martyr's death. Remember, he was actually on the wing of the temple. He was preaching and sharing the things about God, and the, the Jews hated that, and they started stoning him, and they couldn't kill him with the stones, and they said a fuller that was standing nearby, a fuller was someone who used to beat out wool clothes in the biblical world. In fact, I was reading about that actually this morning. It's kind of a gross job, but they would actually wade, awa wade around in urine, and it was quite a thing. But anyway, they would have what they called a club to beat out the wool, and the stoning wasn't killing James, and so his, history tells us that this fuller was nearby, and he had that club that he used to beat the wool with, and he hit James, kept hitting him over the head until finally he fell to his death, and he died, and that's how he died. And uh, I imagine James thinks about this. Twelve years later, actually, after he wrote this epistle, James died, uh, was killed, was martyred. And so I, I just imagine he's, he's thinking about this epistle he wrote. Consider the prophets who endured suffering and patience, who did it in the name of the Lord. And so he's calling his readers here. Remember, you can do this as you look not only at this patient farmer, also the patriarchs, but lastly, look at the patriarch Job, verse 11. He says, indeed, we count them blessed who endure. Indeed, James says, special attention to this. We count them blessed or happy who have endured. What does Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount? Remember, we've talked about the Sermon on the Mount is very similar to James. Blessed are you when men persecute you and revile you and say all manner of evil things against you. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. And you know what he says? Two reasons why. Listen very carefully. This is important. Great is your reward in heaven and 
so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Same things James is saying, right? Remember the prophets and remember heaven. In fact, we've already seen in James, blessed is a man who endures trials, right? We endure trials, and when we've been approved, will we receive the crown of life? Well, James gives the third and final example of how, to, how they should follow when considering patience and perseverance in the patriarch Job. Notice what he says. You've heard of Job. You've heard of the perseverance of Job. And just a little bit of Bible trivia. This is the only time Job is mentioned in the New Testament. So there you go. But James says you've heard of this guy. You might say, well, how would they know? Remember, James is steeped in Old Testament terminology, all Jews would know, all good Jews would know about the patriarch Job. And you might say, well, Susan, why does he give the example of Job? Well, he went through some pretty bad suffering, right? Uh, ten children, gone. They were here today, gone. All of his wealth, physical ailments, boils all over his entire body insensitivity from his friends. You know, he had three friends, and what does he say? You're all miserable. <laughs> You're miserable comforters. Have you ever had one of those? And his wife, who told him to curse God and die. And yet it says in all this, Job did not sin with his mouth. He did not sin with his mouth. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gave me ten children. The Lord took my ten children. Blessed be the name of the Lord, you know. We just heard about a lady the other night who died and left 10 children. And uh, in fact, I was looking at um, some things that they had Zoomed, right? they actually Zoomed her death and how her family was standing by singing to her and praying. And, you know, I'm sure that that's very hard for them, right? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And, James, and, and Job did that. And, and James is calling his readers, remember Job. Remember Job. Incredible perseverance. And, you know, he calls them to remember this in, this in the sense that he says, consider the end. Consider the end of what happened. Ladies, a lot of times we don't look at the big picture. That's what, why we get into so much trouble when we go through trials. We don't consider the end. And James says, consider Job. Consider the end, that the Lord is very compassionate. He's very merciful. Ladies, even though Job went through things that you and I cannot even imagine, the end was better than the beginning, right? Do you remember the end? Do you remember the last act of Job? What happened? Do you know the end of Job? It's great. Do you know the Bible says the Lord blessed the end of Job more than the beginning? Do you know he had 14,000 sheep at the end, 6,000 camels, 1,000 oxen, 1,000 female donkeys? And then he got seven sons and three daughters, and no daughters were as fair as Job's. And he lived 140 more years. He saw his grandchildren and even his great-grandchildren. The end was better than the beginning. Now, that doesn't do away with the hurt and the loss of all that. Horrible. I mean, sure, it was painful. And, that's, and James is not saying this to say to you and I that if something happens, you're going to get more in the end. But you know what? The ultimate end is what? <laughs> glory. So whether the end of the thing is better in this life or the end of the thing is better in that life, it's a good deal, right? In fact, I've lived long enough now that I have actually seen this really happen where I've gone through, and my husband and I too, have gone through heartaches and sufferings that were like, what in the world's going on? Lord, why are you, why is this happening? And now I can, I've lived long enough to say, yeah, the end of that thing was better than the beginning, and the Lord is good and righteous and gracious. And that's what James says. He's compassionate. He's very merciful. He's very merciful. Ecclesiastes 7, 8 says this, The end of a thing is better than the beginning, and the patient, is, the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Ladies, and I know you girls can understand this too you've you've had you've gone through things in life I mean I'm just looking at some of you right now that I know that have gone through uh, sufferings in your marriage and your family and yet you can say the end is better than the beginning and James says the Lord is very compassionate he's big hearted <laughs> that's what the word compassionate means he's big hearted and he's full of compassion and mercy mercy 
Ladies, the Lord cares about your miseries. He cares about that. He's full of mercy. Don't think God is hard and cold. He has a father's heart. And when he allows darkness to come, it's for a reason. Isaiah says, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. I have inscribed you on the palm of my hands, Isaiah says. Deuteronomy 33, 27, another comforting verse that Elizabeth Elliot would open all of her radio broadcasts with. By the way, I'm reading a great book that just came out this last year, actually just a few months ago, called Becoming Elizabeth Elliot. I highly encourage you to read it. But... Um, she would read this before all of her radio broadcasts. Deuteronomy 33, 27. The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms. I love that. Jeremiah 31, 3. I have loved you with an everlasting love. So, ladies, what's causing you to be impatient today? Traffic? Long lines at the grocery store? People that talk too much? A crying baby or a strong-willed child? Do things like misplaced keys, stuck zippers, popped buttons, cold food, spilled milk, interruptions in your day, phone calls, deadlines, and feeling rushed make you feel impatient? Maybe it's cooking, shopping, cleaning, doing laundry, your in-laws, pulling weeds, flat tires, balancing your checkbook, doing your taxes, waiting for test results from the doctor, or people that rub you the wrong way and make you impatient. The things that cause us to be impatient are really mundane compared to James readers, right? But they're still important to our Heavenly Father. He, he cares about, you know, he knows how many hairs are on our head. He cares about those things. He cares when the sparrow falls. So he cares about those little things that irritate you. But he wants us to accept each one of them as an opportunity to be patient in closing, I want to give you some principles that we can learn from this text, okay? And they're in the form of an acrostic patience. Patient, actually patient, not patience. And they're from the text. So I want to give them to you as we close. Number P, the first one is P. Right? That's the first word in patient, right? Prophet's example. Next time you're tempted not to be patient, look at the prophet's example. Verse 10, be patient. Look at the prophets. Look at Job. They endured suffering, and they came through as gold. Go back to the Old Testament. Read those prophets and be encouraged. The A, consider the arrival of the Lord. Verse 7, ladies, be patient in view of the Lord's return. He's coming, and we're going to give an account for our murmuring <laughs> and lack of patience with each other. E, or, I'm sorry, not E, T, the end is not yet here. The end is not yet here, verse 11. Be patient by realizing you don't have the big picture. The story hasn't ended yet. The end of what the Lord does in our lives is pretty incredible. Anticipate it. Wait for it. One man said, patience is bitter, but its fruits are sweet. Patience is bitter, but its fruits are sweet. I the illustration of the farmer. Next time you're tempted to be impatient, look at the illustration of the farmer. Verse 7. The farmer does not get angry at those poor defenseless plants who can do nothing about the lack of rain. And you and I should not get impatient either. E. Establish your hearts. Establish your hearts. Verse 8. Be patient. Be steadfast. Prop yourself up. <laughs> be firm. Be unwavering. In, no murmuring. Next time you're tempted to get impatient, no murmuring. Verse 9, do not murmur, especially taking it out on your brothers and sisters. Ladies, murmuring only further cements the difficulty in your mind and causes you to become a critical person. Thankfulness is a cure for murmuring and complaining. Look at the good that God is doing in the situation. Don't look at the bad. And then last T, remember, tender-hearted is God. Tender-hearted is God. Be patient, realizing God is tender-hearted. He's merciful. He's not a mean God in heaven waiting to inflict pain on you. He's tender, even in the hard times. His faithfulness is great. His mercies are new every morning. Thank you for watching Susan Hex with the Master YouTube channel. 
I am Pam Sheehan. Susan is my friend and mentor, and I tape, edit, and manage Susan's YouTube channel. I can attest that Susan loves bringing the Word of God to the women of God in order to help us grow in our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to be part of this growing group of growing women, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel, hit that bell to be notified when we post new content, and please feel free to share this video with your friends and your family. And finally, clicking that thumbs up is always appreciated. If you would like to financially support this ministry, please go to Susan's webpage at www with the master all one word dot org at the top of the page is a pink donate button that will take you to our church's homepage, grace community church of tulsa this is where susan's ministry receives elder oversight to donate to susan click on the drop down menu in the to box and select with the master susan heck then continue to complete the form and follow the prompts. Your gift to Susan will help support this ministry in its goal of blessing women with the eternal words of our living God.